Welcome to chapter 14, the penultimate chapter in the series. In this chapter, we're going to bring together the concepts uh, from across the book, across the chapters so far, to culminate in this idea of a services marketing loyalty, retention, and relationship strategy. Now, the first thing to address before we move into discussing customer loyalty is that relationship marketing, loyalty-based service products, and ongoing recurrent service products are a strategic choice. You can as easily structure your service to be uh, for a short term, for a transaction, for a here is an immediate problem that our solution can solve, but we are not looking to retain ongoing, recurrent, long term engagement. And these need to be strategic choices. These are strategic decisions. So while services is prone to being able to create the conditions for customer loyalty and for customer relationship marketing, and a lot of what we understand about relationship marketing evolved out of services practice in the late 90s, it's not a fait accompli. For example, if you are engaged in a government uh, department, government service delivery, you can have a service which is intended to be a one shot. The customer only ever uses it once. The idea of a recurrent repeating uh, use of the service would indicate a service failure if people had to keep coming back to the service. For example, taxation department could easily have a rehabilitation program for people who have engaged in tax misconduct. It's a service that they provide to assist people uh, recovering from uh, prior, well, in the case of paying too much, uh, earning too much in one year, the government has a service. It will provide prepayment for your estimated next year's tax. If you don't have a tax bill, uh, an excessive tax bill in the following year, then that service shouldn't be you shouldn't have to worry about that service. It should be a one shot. Uh, similarly, there are various things in terms of health programs, health services. It's nice to have an ongoing recurrent relationship with a general practitioner, but you probably don't want to have a customer loyalty frequent flyers card for a surgeon. The surgery itself can be an ongoing going concern because it will have enough new customers that the surgeon has a viable operation career and the clients are one shot, no loyalty because you don't need to come back if they get their job right the first time. So before we just lock in to the discussion around loyalty, it is really important uh, when you are looking at service to decide do you want it to be something that focuses around customer loyalty, therefore midterm to long-term game plan, or is it okay for the nature of the service to be one shot, to be short term, to be done quickly, efficiently, effectively, and with the intention of never seeing that customer again? See also lawyers uh, and criminal defense lawyers. You really don't want a 10 criminal trials and uh, discount card. So for customer loyalty, there are a couple of precursors that are necessary. Loyalty is more than just retention or satisfaction. Loyalty has a Cognitive components in terms of people will be loyal to services where they see an economic trade-off, but it has an emotive component of loyalty is a connection 
and a commitment to the organization. It can be based on a sense of reciprocity. You want the company to do well because you are happy with the company services. You have a regular coffee shop that you attend because you know the staff there. You have a hairdressing salon where you are a regular because you know the clientele. And it goes from, I know I can have repeated successful service to I am interested in maintaining this relationship between myself and the people at that service provider. And loyalty can move further down into, uh, as we've seen in consumer behavior, you can get the ideas of tribalism, you can get the ideas of brand community. It's easier to do that when there are people when your brand is represented by people and uh, there is the opportunity for emotive connections between employee and customer at, and this creates a social bond and a commercial bond. Now, loyalty is more than, as I said, more than retention. It's more than just the uh, 10 stamps on a card type of thing. Satisfaction as well uh, is not always the same as retention. You can continue to go to a service where you're not getting the best deal or you're not getting the maximum satisfaction, but you're getting satisficing. The trade-off between being satisfied and convenience is worth enough that you are being retained by that firm. You are using their services but you're not at the you're not going to be loyal to them and you're not going to actively seek them out should circumstances change. Similarly, it's always possible to have customers who are completely satisfied with the service provision, but their personality traits and their consumption patterns, novelty seekers, innovation seekers, they will go to a portfolio of service providers because they have a need for newness and difference. So your product is completely satisfactory. They are very happy with the service provision and they're off somewhere else because they want to be happy experiencing a new thing. Whereas the guarantee, the loyalty, the safety that your successful satisfactory service is providing is contrary to one of their purchase uh, decisions. One of the things that they're looking for in a product. So loyalty also is going to, loyalty is category driven. You can be incredibly brand loyal in one category and not brand loyal at all in a different area. So it's not persona and it's not personality driven, it's category driven. And there are factors and facets for cultivating loyalty amongst your clientele. And to that end, one of the things that we want to talk about is looking at the creation of customer loyalty. Now, each of these is key ideas, each of these are key words, which there is depth and detail in the text. But I want to pick up on a couple of the overarching elements here. The first is what you're doing with the customer loyalty is you are working towards creating in uh, relationship marketing terms, trust, commitment, and reciprocity. Now, trust is a factor on its own, and we'll deal with that in the next slide. Commitment and reciprocity. Commitment here, we look at things like staying in touch, Reminders that the customer wants. Incentives to participate and re-participate in the service. These are attempting to show that we are, as providers, committed to you as customers and evoking that sense of reciprocity of, you've got our back, we have yours, you should keep being our customer. Uh, to do this, you can also, to create that loyalty, you want to have a couple of elements here, one of which you'll note the training and, empower, and empowering employees. 
this becomes a facet here is loyalty is not necessarily to the firm. Loyalty can be to the person who embodies the brand, who embodies the firm. So we think back right to the top to the seduction model. The employee, the brand, the firm, the service, it's represented in multiple parts, but a key part is the employee. Which is why you're going to get the uh, element here of be great with names. And look, I'm also going to say someone with face blindness, that's really difficult. But you can fix it. There are ways and means and tricks. Midpoint. Replace technology with humans. This idea of loyalty, uh, again, why it's a strategic decision. Loyalty may not be the optimum approach for your service product. If you are looking at a search-based search attribute, replicable, automated, self-service driven service, you can replace the human with technology and people will be loyal to you because it's fast, efficient, and you don't have to talk to another person. Apps, service, digital um, processes, digital apps, uh, services based in technology can get loyalty on the grounds of it's there when you need it most. It's 24 seven or it's reliable or it has another facet. So again, strategic decision. How much are you, how much of your product is necessitated by human interaction? How much is supported by the invisible systems against the visible employees? So loyalty, again, these are not, you have to check everything off the list. You have to work with what will facilitate your value offer improving. What makes it worth someone's time to engage in your service provision uh, and make it better for them through some of these facets? So customer retention. This is, uh, again, an interesting philosophical argument, stretches back a long time in marketing theory. It also sits inside the Ansoft matrix uh, in terms of growth strategies of if you have existing customers, do you want to retain them by selling more of the existing product to them? Or do you want to retain them by creating a product that is new, which you offer to them? Now, conquest marketing is a lovely term there, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone actually go out and say, here's the strategy, we're going out for a quick conquest. Retention though, you'll hear a lot of that. You'll hear retention mentioned on a regular basis in part because the idea of a retention strategy is this approach. Again, we're talking 90s theories. Uh, churn costs money. Recruiting new customers costs money. All the stuff we looked at in the elements of the marketing mix around person, around people, around how customers co-create Retaining an existing customer creates efficiencies that you don't get if you don't hang on to them. So the economic aspects for retaining are quite high, which always raises the question of why then we don't have a sort of perpetual retention strategy. Sometimes it's because what we are looking at that we've created a market that we have existing customers but the market itself is renewing so your existing customers if they're all generation baby boomer and you are thinking about generation post millennial then the population growth might have slowed but you're looking at someone towards the end of the product life cycle and the customer life cycle against someone at the front of the customer life cycle so there's quite often a chase incentive. Uh, there also are the incentives from stakeholders, shareholders, and the market 
where growth can only come through new, or the perception is that growth must come through new customers. So customer acquisition becomes the sacred cow. If you're not bringing in new customers, you're not growing, therefore you're not going to get venture funding, seed funding, your next rounds of uh, venture capital. So whilst it is important once you've got a customer to hang on to them and make value out of them, there are still rationales for ignoring retention in favour of expansion. Uh, in terms of uh, the retention, competition is a major factor now. Uh, there are a lot, and global competitiveness as well. Although logistics and shipping channels are still a challenge and global borders still exist, and paying things in multiple currencies is still painful, the internet has created a much broader market. And it's also opened up opportunities for shell company shop fronts of a .com AU address setting up an Australian chapter of a global website where all the finance, paperwork, legal things and everything else transacts on the Australian IP range but the actual functional uh, company itself is based out of somewhere else entirely. And if you've ever used the online custom printing service Vistaprint, you'll periodically buy something from vistaprint.com.au that ships to you from countries that you weren't expecting uh, because the impression that they give in their advertising is that you're going to be buying from Bauer or... Uh, you know, somewhere off the uh, Sunshine Coast, and you get a package shipped to you from Belgium. And you're like, okay. Competition is now also a case of when you are opening a service, if your service can be digitized, you are capable of competing at a much broader array, but you're also capable of being competed against. Which brings you to a strategic decision in this aspect as well of do I want to focus my service product on physical close quarters easier to retain by proximity customers or do I want to chase different channels? Do I want to look for my niche wherever it is around the world? Or do I want to create my uh, retention based around physicality, proximity? So it's service scape versus distribution. It's, again, a strategic set of choices you've got to make. Now, the other things on customer retention, why it's useful is uh, customers, basically, the evolution of the internet, uh, the evolution of TV shows where the TV the amount of reality TV shows that are based on showing you the back end of businesses cooking, um, coffee shops. The, the existence of a TV show called Cake Wars means that bakery is now a competitive sport. Means a whole bunch of service things that were previously very invisible. Uh, things in the service blueprint that were behind closed doors suddenly are much higher profile, much more visible. And it's sold to you as entertainment medium, but it does mean that we have a considerably more informed and also capable of being informed if they so choose type of audience. So retaining someone who is a good fit for your firm and you can communicate value of our ongoing partnership together to that customer, definitely it you can change that dynamic. You can also change the dynamic simply in the fact that with things like social media, with Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you can directly communicate with your customer and you can build up a much greater customer relationship, sometimes outside of the service transaction, so that when the service transaction rolls around, you have a much, you have a pre-established relationship that you can leverage off in favor of based on uh, your existing social dynamics, social communication. Uh, the other thing, benefits, let's talk, uh, the last thing on this is 
loyal customers will bring other customers. Uh, loyal customers who have a good value offer then have something in terms of social capital to share with others. If you are the one who discovers the great new thing and your social circle looks to you as a, so as a leader, then loyalty has its privileges of if I've been, if I can retain this customer, this customer will bring me other customers. You also uh, have the fact that longer term customers, you have established a relationship. You've also built up profile. You've got internal marketing information about them. You've got preference data. You've got prior purchase data. So it's easier to create custom offers for them. They are definitely more prone to uh, buying the more expensive packages or increasing the, uh, if not the volume of what they buy from you, certainly they are going to be much more interested in your more advanced, more expensive products because they've got familiarity. And the final reason to do this is straight up, when you bring a new customer into a service, they are more expensive than an existing customer. So, profit. Now, quick uh, calculation elements here that you need to be able to address. We are looking at uh, a quick bit of maths here. The textbook covers it in more details, but I want to talk to the philosophy here. And this is the idea of a lifetime value calculation. Because services is human interaction commercialized, there are moments where you are going to find a role conflict between your role as the provider of service to a customer and your calculative element of how much is this customer worth? Is this customer worth retaining? So the lifetime value, average sales by the number of times you expect to sell to this customer versus the profit per sale, by the number of reorders. There will be a point where a good customer, a loyal customer, a regular customer will start having a declining lifetime value. And at this point, you are going to need to make a calculation. And that calculation is, is it worthwhile retaining the customer? Now, there's been some great examples of this. Up in Brisbane, there was a hairdressing salon that fired every single client they had. They put a ban. Uh, anyone who had previously been to them in the last five years or ten years would not be permitted to, to be uh, given their haircuts in that salon ever again. That was it. Lifetime ban. They just sacked every customer they had. And if you're sitting here thinking, that sounds like a guaranteed way of going broke, not only did they sell out, they had a waiting list because they created artificial exclusivity. You were one of the chosen who got to go to this salon. Exclusivity, price, quality, intangible facets that by sacking their clientele, by sacking their customer base, they were able to create something out of a customer retention, out of the inversion of a customer retention program. So in terms of keeping a customer, uh, there are certain points where customers straight up, they're not profitable. They're gonna cost you more to service than you're getting back from them. Uh, you've been, if you've got contractual ongoing uh, sort of long-term contract and there, there are service elements in terms of maintenance or support or other aspects where they haven't bought from you for a while, but you are still expending money maintaining and keeping the relationship going. Uh, there are points where you should, because at the end of the day, your employees are more valuable to you than a single customer is. With the asterisk that if you've got an employee who's basically 
causing grief or problems, they are less valuable to you overall. Standard HR practice, standard being sensible about things. But if you have a customer who lowers employee morale, if you have a customer who is causing problems by servicing that customer, they are not a worthwhile customer to retain. Trust, commitment and reciprocity only goes so far. Uh, if the reciprocity of we, they expect you to put up with whatever they do and you have to tolerate it or it's, and it's their way or the highway, that's not reciprocity. So there is an idea that the customer is always right, but the customer is frequently wrong. Sometimes they're the wrong customer. Sometimes they are straight up exploitative, abusive, and should be removed from the playing field. Don't keep those customers. Think also not just your employee's well-being, but if you've got someone who is abusive um, and abusing their role in the service engagement, then seduction model says they're going to be screwing up the experiences of your other customers. Similarly, the uh, customers who are drawing too much of the service. When we looked at the, the customer complaining behaviors, uh, some of the complaining behaviors might result in a customer being deemed to be beyond reasonable, but meeting their needs, even if they're throwing cash around the place at you, uh, would result in a reduced service for the other customers. So you're better off keeping your larger customer base and dispensing with a smaller one if the finances or the employee morale or the long-term connection of the brand makes it make sense. You also have uh, reputational issues of, there are gonna be some customers out there that if they're hanging out at your service, you want rid of them because they are a poor fit to your brand. You want to be careful on that front because there are also, there are laws around discrimination, there's laws and marketing is an applied form of discrimination for financial gain. So your ethics alarm should go off here. But you're also looking at this from the point of view of if you are selling to a customer who is known to be an abuser of other customers, or you're selling to a customer with a known position that views other members in your customer, uh, other potential customers or other actual customers or employees as subhuman or expendable, they're not worth, that customer is not worth the money unless you want to set yourself up with that brand. I mean, basically, if you're, you can always make strategic choices. You can always make tactical choices. It may be that the reputation will shed. You have decided that you'll service this particular audience because it will shed other audiences you do not want. The customer's reputation is particularly poor, so associating tarnishes the image or rather changes and repositions your brand image that you have decided that strategically, this is who you are, this is what you do, and you will shed the other customers. So in essence, by keeping customer A, you're gonna get rid of customers B to K, but if that's your choice, that's your choice. Again, it's always gonna be strategic. It's always gonna be decision driven of, here's a thing that I want to do and why I want to do it. Coming down the, uh, the close out end of this, uh, customer retention programs, basically four, th four ideas in this. Uh, again, on the service side, trying to get service customers to buy more frequently, and self growth the matrix, sell existing, sell more to existing customers. Relationship marketing, uh, again, we've talked about that on the way through, trust, commitment, reciprocity, the Grun Roos, um, Nordic school approach where the aim is to establish that people will want to buy from you repeatedly. They will want to come back to you because there is benefit in you being their primary provider. Uh, the aftermarketing, I've raised a little bit of this. Services often is used as an aftermarketing tool on large capital, uh, large capital physical objects, physical goods. So if you look at 
uh, things like Christopher Lovelock's Service Flower, you'll find that the notion of services as the augmented product or the extended product uh, is very strong emphasis of aftermarketing. At the same time, because services is intangible, it's much easier for someone to do a follow-up. For example, you could set up a consultancy firm that does advisory, uh, strategic advice, strategic planning, and six months later comes back as part of that initial product, initial uh, strategic plan, strategic goal setting product, has a goal review exercise. Now you price it at an according premium for the aftermarketing, but if you came back, ran the strategic review, you may be able to use that as your stepping stone into the relationship marketing of once a year, we will provide a strategic consultancy for you, for money, for pay. It is a two part. The after marketing event will be in the mid year or fourth quarter to enable you to decide what you want to focus on for your next strategic consulting at the start of the following year. So after marketing can be used uh, to support frequency marketing and support relationship marketing. Uh, guarantees, a couple of things on the guarantees. That's what I mentioned on the way past. You've got to be careful about these these days. Uh, basically, in terms of this is one where the lawyers will show up, mostly from your side, trying to weasel your way out of absolutely everything you agreed to. If you look at the three different types of guarantees here, though, you've got to also see a distinct connection to the type of product you're talking about. So if we think about something like the a credence-based service product, where the customer isn't going to know if they have had a good service, they may not even know if they're satisfied with the service. That's not a good fit for an unconditional guarantee. Similarly, credence based might be very difficult to have specific result guarantees. I mean, you can imagine medicine and surgery as you know, a specific guarantee. Cancer removed or double your money back. Not necessarily what you're looking at. Uh, specific result guarantees can be things like satisfaction. So, or if it's uh, a service being performed on goods or service being performed on objects, then these can be indemnities, these can be guarantees, the following you know, checklist will have been followed. Um, the unconditional guarantee works best where it's small, fast, and you know, if it's a search-based uh, attribute for a service, then it's gonna be easier to do full refunds because it's going to be easier for the customer to go, yes, I'm satisfied, no, I'm not. A lot of fast food vendors have the unconditional guarantee about um, satisfaction with the quality of the food in the first two or three bites. Now, if you're not happy at that point in time, we'll remake it for you. So you can do this, but you've got to really link the type of guarantee you want to operate to the type of service product that you've created to the realistic likelihood that the customer will know whether they're satisfied or not fast enough for the guarantee to be put into effect. So to bring it home, the uh, unconditional guarantees, they do have their role, they do have their benefits. Uh, what you're really looking at here is using them as a leverage tool. Now we mentioned risk very early on in the chapters and how risk can be alleviated through guarantees. And if you look at the guarantee, the benefits list here, perception of value, reduction of risk, you're modifying value conditions. Uh, if you are offering an unconditional guarantee, you are basically saying that 
you back your service to be delivered right each time, every time. You are also saying that to the customer, we will absorb the risk of you that you will take by consuming the service. You may not enjoy the service, the service may not be the right fit for you, but we will take that risk on your behalf. So it's a lower risk, the risk reduction aspect for you. And again, it's all about positioning, it's all about the fit, it's all about uh, making certain that if your customer is going to need to show dissatisfaction or uh, some aspect of the service failed to deliver, that you can actually measure, or they will be able to measure, whether the service took place, whether the service failed. You're also tying guarantees to service recovery. So you want to think back to those two connections. Because when you are engaging the service recovery, the guarantee uh, from your side, what it, its value and what it does for you, is it does move from production orientation to market orientation. You will be thinking, is the customer satisfied? Not, have we delivered to our processes? Uh, you can make it goal-based, so guarantees then become a metric and a measurement tool. Uh, if you go back and look at the service gap model, the guarantee can be used to resolve where there is a difference between expectation and perception. And the point of failure can be used as a trigger to review both the service blueprint, the internal service, uh, the invisible services, the internal elements of the service gap model. So the activation of a guarantee can replace a complaining behavior. It can be, it is a form of complaining behavior to activate the guarantee, but it can also then create an avenue for you to be able to go, what is our, where is the point of failure? Where is the locus of control? Uh, the satisfaction hasn't been met. Where can we then act on this and make use of that data and knowledge we have just gained? And finally, on the professional, uh, Service guarantees, these are almost like insurance policies uh, and services can be insured so you can actually set up a service insurance, professional insurance, indemnity insurance because if you're going to guarantee a professional service, this means that you can charge more. You are doing very deliberate positioning to say, yes, my price is high, but I'm willing to wear the costs if something goes wrong. The service is customized, so it's not like it's going to be returnable or reusable anyway. And it's also an area where the professional service guarantee lets you activate the four pillars insofar as a service guarantee, particularly one that's based around restitution of we will fix the problem rather than refund. So customization, if it goes wrong, we will be there all the steps of the way to help you recover. Uh, even though you may have been the firm that caused it, you'll be the firm that fixes it. So there's a bunch of stuff to work with here that you can use for brand positioning, brand recognition. You can use to communicate quality before the purchase. And also, since you are looking at something like this sitting around a credence or experience-based product, you are using it as a means to communicate to the customer that... Although it will be uncertain, you as a service provider have confidence that it can be delivered and delivered in a way that lowers their risk and putting the service guarantee out there also says that you are confident that there is no risk of failure because you've got a lot riding on it. Now, the customer has less riding on it, you have more riding on it, you have absorbed the risk, the customer is more likely to be able to go I will accept that risk or I accept the uncertainty because you have also bought in uh, to the uncertainty, to the risk. So the shared mutual uh, risk factor reduces the overall perception of risk. So again, as a toolkit, as a strategic toolkit, it can be useful to attract certain types of clientele and certain types of customers. 
it has to always be tied, as with everything else here, it's a strategic decision. Do you, the creation of a service guarantee also can put just that little extra doubt into the cust into the minds of certain customers of why do you need to guarantee it if it's, I didn't think this was a thing that could go wrong that needed a guarantee, now you've guaranteed it, what is it that could go wrong? So there are pros and cons to the whole thing, but it's all gotta be strategically based, all based on your positioning strategy, your game plan, the type of product you're offering and the type of audience you're trying to address.